So, Tim, you've been to Syria twice this year. Uh, I don't know what officials, how high up you got to see, but uh, is this a surprise, for the developments? Uh, it's just a surprise for them, if you think. Uh, the developments of the last week or so, where Trump initially appeared to have impetuously decided to give a green light to Erdogan, the Tur president of Turkey, to invade Syria. Uh, and then he turned around and, and threatened to destroy the economy if they... Uh, don't do what he says. And now we've gotten a five-day ceasefire. And the biggest news, of course, is the Kurds have had to uh, form an alliance with the Syrian central government and the Syrian Arab army has arrived in Manjbi and other uh, important parts of that area, which is a really huge development in the war, too. Yeah, it is a big development and uh, a lot has turned around in a few days. But I should say from the Syrian point of view, it's not entirely unexpected um, because uh, if you go back a few years, the Syrian army has not had serious conflict with the Kurdish militia, um, even when the Turkish leadership had uh, moved its agenda into northern Syria. Remember, the, the far, by far the biggest group and the biggest force behind the Kurdish autonomy is the Turkish group, which have had a very long history with Turkey suppressing their culture and so on. There hasn't been that same sort of problem in Syria. And uh, in Syria, the Syrian army was arming the Kurdish militia against Daesh to start with, basically. It was only with the introduction of the US sponsorship of this um, uh, separatist project that the relationship began to break down. But there hasn't really been serious conflict in the past between the Syrian Kurds and Damascus. I'm sorry, who, who did you say was arming the ISIS? The, no, no, the, I said that the Syrian army was arming the Kurds to defend Kurds. themselves That's from right. ISIS. Yeah. Right. So That's there was cooperation between the Syrian Kurds and the Syrian army, and that was undermined in the first instance by the US occupation. Well, that's interesting. I don't think that was well known, that there was already some relationship there. But surely the Kurds would not have liked to have made this uh, decision, because they still, I think, had dreams of an independent republic there. Uh, do they lose any chance of autonomy because of this arrangement or is that something they can still work out? Uh, look, I think, as I said, the situation in Turkey for the Kurds and the situation in Syria are very, very different. And we have to be aware of that. And there was a Turkish right. agenda driving this Rojava project, this uh, separatist project in Syria. Um, certainly they've had to give that, that up because Damascus is very clear and indeed, Russia supporting Damascus was clear on that point too, that they couldn't. I mean, I think actually there was an attempt, um, perhaps about a week or 10 days ago, for the separatist militia, which isn't always in sync with the population on the ground there, I, I might add. And let's bear in mind that the Kurdish people are not a majority in most of these areas that have been claimed. Uh, there's a lot of other Syrian people there. But the militia was trying to get the Syrian army to protect them from the Turks without allowing uh, Syria to uh, take over control as, uh, as the national authority there. In the end, they had to give up that. They had to give up that separatist dream to become part of uh, the Syrian army, but basically be incorporated into the Syrian army. And that, of course, also robbed uh, Erdogan of his pretext for invading Syria. Are you saying that the YPP, the uh, KPP, rather the Kurdish, Turkish Kurds, were instigators of the uh, independence movement in Syria? The Turkish Kurd uh, group, the PKK, um, is the major driver of the separatist project, that's true. Because they can't succeed in Turkey, I guess. Um, they wanted a base. I mean, to this extent, yeah. uh, President Erdogan has wanted a base there. I'm sorry, I think we missed that. Could you repeat the last bit? Yes, the, the PKK, remember there's 20 million Kurdish people in Turkey and there's about one and a half million max in Syria. Many of the Syrians were quite happy to be part of a pluralist Syria. Syria, after all, is a state which is very much committed to, very many centuries of being committed to the defense of minorities. Um, whereas in Turkey, the Kurds had had their language repressed, their culture repressed um, historically since uh, over the last century, basically. Right. So... Um, yeah, the, the Turkish leadership has, has played a very strong role in the separatist movement in the north of Syria. Okay, so what happens now with this ceasefire? Apparently this gives a chance for civilians to withdraw, but will the Turkish military operation with their Arab militias that they're backing, will that continue after five days? So this was, uh, of course, it was coming for some time, the, the conflict between the US and Turkey over how, 
the proxies that we're using and how they were seeking to maintain influence in the north of Syria, that tension was coming for some time. It burst over when Trump decided to got his own way effectively with the, the military industrial complex, as he's recently called it, and moved out. Um, I think what's happening now is to some extent the US, but more importantly, Russia, uh, giving Erdogan a chance to climb down out of his tree. He's got up into this um, idea of having a safe zone and so on and uh, presenting the PKK base in Syria as um, a big driver. In reality, of course, he wanted to expand the zone of influence. He wanted a Muslim Brotherhood aligned group of Syrians like there is in Idlib, basically the, the Al Qaeda groups, so the extreme Islamists to control that part and therefore have that sort of influence in the north of Syria. So I think the US to some extent, and even more so Russia, because it's Russia that now has its troops positioned with the Syrians in, those north, in many of those northern towns, that's giving um, Erdogan pause. Are we looking, uh, I was gonna mention, aside from Idlib, are we looking at uh, an end of this eight year war and the reconstitution of the lost territories of the Syrian government? In other words, hundreds of thousands of people may have died for nothing in this Western and Gulf back to hardest attempt at regime change. Yes, but there's still some uncertainties there, aren't there? I mean, the retreat of US troops from northern Syria is welcome because that 800 kilometer board with Turkey is a very sensitive issue for the security of Syria and to some extent for Turkey as well. So the resumption of good relationships between Turkey and Syria down the track is very important for ending the war. But let's remember there's also a US occupation in South Syria in Al Tanf, which is cutting off the main uh, route to Baghdad and uh, strategically speaking in regional terms the US and Israel uh, have been very focused on the idea of an Iranian what they call an Iranian land bridge that is to say yeah. a normal infrastructural link between Tehran Baghdad Damascus Beirut for example um, that uh, so the Al Tanf occupation the fact that the US is still occupying oil fields on the eastern side of Deir Ezzur province for example that still remains. It's not entirely clear whether Trump's withdrawal is going to, it would be very welcome from the Syrian point of view if they did pull out of Al Tanf and pull out of uh, east of the Euphrates down near Deir Ezzur. That is keeping Syria's own oil supply, its, its power uh, supply for the population from Syria. That's why they've been more dependent on getting oil from Iran, for example. So <clears throat> there are a few things up in the air in terms of whether the US will withdraw from the other parts of Syria. Uh, are they effectively uh, disrupting supplies from Iran to Hezbollah in El Taf by being in the, uh, deployed there, the U.S.? They're doing that, but uh, more importantly, they're disrupting supplies to Syria. You remember that tanker that was stopped at Gibraltar eventually got through, basically. I mean, the Syrian population generally hmm. is very seriously affected by these sanctions and attempts to blockade um, energy supplies getting into the country, for example. Uh, Hezbollah is only one part of it. Elizabeth, could you give us some perspective on what you see moving forward? I know that Joe already asked if is this the end of the war, but whether it is or isn't and how far along that is, um, you know, to the side for a moment, what do you see moving forward in the more in the more immediate short term in the next few weeks and months? Well, from the Syrian point of view, their um, their aim has been to liberate the entire country, every inch of the country, as the president said. Uh, let's remember historically we've got a 50-year occupation in the set of international law whatever President Trump said whatever Mr Netanyahu said international law is very clear that Syrian territory but Syria being a small state has had to proceed uh, step by step in a systematic way that's why they proceeded um, with the uh, the armed groups uh, in various parts of the country to the point where They've liberated most of the country except in Idlib and those areas which are still occupied. That is to say, Turkey in the north still, the US is still in the southeast and the south and Israel in the south. So there is a systematic program going on in Syria. They've been gaining in this. Certainly they've been, they made some important advances in the first four years of the war. But since Russia came in, of course, there's been a systematic uh, and not just Russia, but Iran also has a, a strong presence there. They, since late 2015, there's been steady progress there, only disrupted really by the, the, occu the, the occupation by four big powers, Turkey, the US and Israel. So I think things are proceeding systematically in that sort of way. We saw some advances in Idlib recently, but uh, the Syrian government has always said, look, we can't say 
when this war is going to end, so long as there is this uh, intervention by foreign powers, which gives shelter to the proxy armies that they've supported. You know, the US was trying to keep uh, so-called SDF control over uh, large swathes of eastern and, and northeastern Syria, including areas like Raqqa and Mumbij, where there were very few Kurdish people anyway. But nevertheless, after ISIS had gone, they used a new proxy there. Down in the south in Al-Tanf, there is still groups of ISIS, groups of other militia, which, the, which are taking shelter of the, the US base there because the US will attack by air uh, any Syrian forces that come near Al-Tanf. So that's the that's the um, the big uncertainty is the occupation by foreign powers. What are some of the biggest misrepresentations of this recent these recent events in the media that you've seen from your perspective in the last few weeks, in the last few days especially? Yeah, I think in the last few days that that really there's a there's sort of a, a bubble debate going on in the U.S., which is all to do with um, the fact that people who don't like Trump don't like anything he does and won't give him credit for when he does something actually decent. That is to say, withdraw troops from uh, a foreign occupation. Um, whatever else you think of Trump, I think you have to give him credit for that. But of course, there's been a big reaction uh, from the Congress. I mean, the majority of the Congress against the withdrawal. Um, you know, what that means is, you know, pretty shattering really you know does it mean that there's this massive consensus to keep wars going and foreign occupations on this issue trump is completely right you know you might disagree with him on everything else but so there is that uh, discussion going on oh he's thrown the kurds to the wolves well yes true uh, that's true in some sense but of course it was a u.s uh, under um bush and then obama that raised the expectations of separatist groups that they might really be the beneficiaries of some way, but they could only be the beneficiaries if there were a near permanent occupation of those areas. They can't fend for themselves. Um, there's no state in the region that supports a, a, a carving up Iraq or Iran or Syria or Turkey. It, only Israel, only Israel that supports that. And for rather obvious reasons, it makes Israel look more normal as a, uh, a racially based state, basically. Um, so. Uh, and I think some of the U.S. officials um, in their more candid moments admitted this. Uh, I think the former U.S. ambassador to Syria, Robert Ford, said to the Kurds, don't trust us, don't trust us, we're going to let you down. Uh, they, they had those sorts of illusions and that bubble was going to be pricked at some stage and, uh, and Trump's done that. No, I think that's very interesting. I think that's one of the most interesting things watching this development has been the number of voices that maybe you would expect to be anti-war, anti-military industrial complex that have basically said that Trump is abandoning the Kurds and throwing them to the wolves and all of that. So it's, it's, it's been confusing in some ways watching the back and forth where you have people that would never agree with each other on most issues all in this chorus about, about Trump abandoning the Kurds. So yeah, it's interesting to get your perspective on that. I suppose one exception in terms of U.S. politics has been Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard has made the has stepped out of the the, the factional or the party debate to make a, a clear point about that issue, at least. Yeah, definitely, Joe. Well, there is a consensus to keep wars and occupation going, and uh, yeah, and Trump is not uh, someone that they like for disrupting that. Whatever his motives. Now, just to follow up on Elizabeth's first question about what you see in the short term here, will the Turks still try to create this safe zone, which ironically Hillary Clinton uh, wanted? Is Trump going to allow the Turks to create the safe zone that, Hillary, that his opponent Hillary Clinton wanted? I think, in, in, in relation to, as I said before, in relation to the South, it's less clear um, because there's still the obsession that Trump shares about the role of the influence of Iran in the region. And uh, of course, this has a bearing on Iraq too, doesn't it? All of the all of the expense and the investment that the U.S. has made in trying to have Iraq as a weak client state is up for grabs if the relationship between Iran, Iraq, and Syria, and for that matter, Hezbollah in in Lebanon, which is effectively the major power in the Lebanese government, if that strengthens, and it is strengthening. This is the this is the dilemma for U.S. intervention in the entire region. That failure in Syria means that their investment in Iraq is also up for grabs, basically. Um, but the safe zone in, in Turkey, I think that's, uh, you know, if the, the Kurdish militia are incorporated into the Syrian army, 
the pretext that Erdogan is using at the moment disappears. Now, Erdogan is a very difficult person. The Damascus doesn't talk to him at all because uh, President Assad thinks he's mad. Nevertheless, Russia and Iran talk to Erdogan and to some extent they've been boxing him in and uh, committing him to the letter of, for example, the Astana agreements in terms of um, defending the territorial integrity of Syria, not trying to carve it up and so on. So there are some powerful friends that Syria has there to, to really, on, in the first instance, stop a escalating war between Syria and Turkey. And then after that, to try and make some sort of settlement in the north there. Um, the east and the southeast, um, the relationship between uh, the, the normal channels and the communications. All, trade is open between Iraq and Syria, but the US is still down there. The US is still sitting on oil fields. The US is still trying to obstruct that normal constructive relationship between neighbors down there. I'm not sure trade ever it, uh, was disrupted. I bought Aleppo soap in Erbil in Iraq a couple of years ago. Surprised to know that. So they're the ones going to be stuck with the refugees. I mean, he, this is domestic political issue for him as well. Um, and an economic one, but he wanted to do it in a completely uh, illegal way towards international humanitarian law, refugee law, which was not to force refugees back into their country, but he wants to this safe zone to drive the refugees out of Turkey back into Syria. With the Syrian Arab army and the Russians there now, uh, what happens to that plan? The Syrians, of course, are not posing an obstacle to that, but what Erdogan's plan was not just to allow or force the refugees back, but to have an administration there, a, a jihadist administration effectively, um, that is controlling that region and then having people under that sort of regime. I mean, really what he is trying to do is extend the Idlib model right. across the whole of North Syria, basically. Um, a number of refugees did go back after Aleppo was liberated. You might recall that there was something like a, a really the, the biggest uh, influx of, of or return of refugees at that time, something in the order of 600, 700,000, went back to Aleppo very, very quickly in that first year in, in 2017. Um, there's still a lot in Turkey, but of course, this has been a card that uh, Erdogan has been playing. He's been playing it with the Europeans very, very blatantly. He got a lot of money out of them back in 2015, 2016. He's trying to play the card again, um, uh, but, uh, you know, the... the the security uh, management of that border is very important. On the one hand, the refugees have been blocked from going back by the war and also by the Turkish authorities. On the other hand, there's been this free flow of international jihadists to keep the, uh, the destabilization going in northern Syria. So uh, the, the, it's a long border and the normalization of that border. At some stage, there has to be a relationship between neighbors, you know, between Ankara and Damascus. There has to be down the track some relationship to manage that. I don't see that happening if the jihadists still are in control in Idlib and if they take control along the uh, Turkish border inside Syria. So, um, I mean, how long can they be contained and for how long could that go on? Is that sustainable? I also wanted to point out, I just remembered that the Russians told the Syrians early on when they first intervened that they would forget about the idea of taking back every inch of Syria. Do you remember when they told them that? Uh, this, when you look in the current context now, are the Russians saying that we've got to hold back on Idlib because there's been some offensives, but they've stopped? Uh, how is that going to resolve itself in Idlib? Um, can you, can, how long can we go on with, with the jihadists running that province? The, the Syrians have been very clear they're going to take back every inch, and that includes uh, Idlib, it includes the Jolan, and the Russians have not seriously contradicted that, in my view. Um, They've said, for example, in relation to the Jolan, which is a harder issue for them than Idlib, it is much harder. They've made some strong statements about Idlib, but in relation to the Jolan, they have not contradicted the Syrians, but there's an expectation, I guess, that the Russians may not be supporting them in doing that because of Russia's relationship with Israel. Uh, and there's been some public statements about this, including from the Hezbollah leader, that they know that Russia is a strong ally in Syria, in Idlib, but when it comes to Israel, that's a different story. So uh, I think there's been a, quite a polarized debate about Russia's role and its relationship with Israel here, but I think the the better, you know, on the, some people are saying that Russia is stabbing Syria in the back because of its relationship with Israel. Some are saying Russia is saving 
Syria. I think that neither of those extremes are right in this situation. But I think the Russians in recent months have made very clear statements about Idlib that they are, they are in there to, uh, to get rid of terrorism in all of Syria and return Idlib to control by the Syrian government. And they're doing the same thing now in Mumbij and in Kobani too, in Ain al Arab at the moment. So I think the Russians are committed to Italy, but they've been doing it in stages because um, remember there's been this diplomatic game, which is a very important game, the Astana process and a series of sea spies in Italy, which are of course uh, a mixed blessing in a sense, um, in, in the sense that on the one hand, it's important to explore all the possibilities of a peaceful resolution there. On the other hand, they can't allow the, the, the Al-Qaeda groups to keep uh, undermining that they don't respect the ceasefires. They attack people in surrounding Idlib, and uh, Aleppo and Latakia, for example, Hammer in the past. So I think the Russians have shown uh, in words and in practice that they are committed to, to liberating Idlib. But as you say, it's a, it's a difficult situation so long as there is this political will in Ankara to keep destabilizing. That, that's a, a very big thorny question because your neighbors don't go away. The US may withdraw, but the neighbors don't go away. Well, I don't think everyone would want another influx of refugees from um, Idlib into Turkey. Uh, is there any chance of direct clashes between Turkish troops or at least their Arab militia and uh, the Syrian Arab army? Has that started? Yes, there has been some, but not a lot. Um, there's been some artillery exchange in the north there, but both sides are pretty keen and mediated by Russia, let's remember, because uh, remember the Russian president invited Erdogan to, uh, I think, to Moscow for talks, and that's going to happen very shortly. I think after he just spoke with uh, Pence, the, the US vice president, he's going to talk to Putin, and they've been on the phone already. So I think Russia is mediating that. They are sitting up there, they have a presence on the ground um, around north of Mumbij, for example. Um, so uh, yes, I think that uh, I think that there is, uh, and, and the US has announced this uh, ceasefire they're talking about at the moment. I really think that from all sides, there are messages. It's not that important that the Trumps talk about uh, sanctions and so on, I don't think, because Erdogan is using that as a card an anti-American card for domestic politics. It's not terribly influential on him, but I think the Russian role is is much more influential. And he said, uh, Erdogan said that he threw uh, Trump's letter in the bin, uh, which I thought was quite amusing. But well, this could be a humiliation for him if if this gambit uh, turns out to be a dud. I mean, if he has to withdraw, doesn't get yes. what he went in to do. Yes, that's true. It, it, but so long as he's going after, he, he's he's inflaming it including the anti-Washington stuff, uh, precisely because that helps him domestically. He's getting some benefit from that domestically and going after the PKK, he's getting some benefit from that domestically too. But uh, yes, you know, there are downsides to it too. Not, not least the, uh, the back, uh, what, do you, what do you talked about people, refugees, but in this case in Idlib, we're talking about the, you know, the a very large percentage of the population in Northern Idlib is now linked to those al-Qaeda groups basically. And so that in itself poses a threat to Turkey. And there have been <clears throat> protests on the border of Idlib and Turkey when they've closed the border to those people trying to get through, for example, when the Syrians and the Russians were pushing them in South Idlib basically. So the attention down to, to Ankara for what's going on in Idlib. Now I hate to ask you to speculate here, but I would like to just get your perspective for a moment on what could have motivated Trump to do this now, if you have an opinion on that. So, and, and I'm not asking you to say, you know, what was he thinking? What exactly is his intention? But what are some of the, the um, you know, impetus, uh, some, of the, some of the things that could have gone into, um, you know, pushing him to make this decision or to announce this now, rather than three months ago, six months from now, et cetera? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to say that Trump's consistent on anything, really. But you, you have to, in a sense, join the dots, don't you, between what he said in the election campaign in 2016, what he said late last year, I think December last year, about a withdrawal from troops, and what he's saying in the last few days, where he not only talks about a withdrawal from Syria, he goes and makes some of these broader points, you know, about... <clears throat> 
his battle with the military industrial complex and so on, and him getting the upper hand in certain areas and so on. And some other reports we've got on the ground from the fact that there was, you know, some sort of near mutiny going on with this, um, with this process in, in Syria itself. So that we've known for some time there's, a, there's an internal struggle in Washington about this whole process, but uh, on this issue at least, um, there seems to be some consistency. If you look 2016, 2018, 2019, Trump is doing something he promised he was going to do and, that, and he's uh, expanding on, he's giving, um, you know, you don't want to take his words too seriously because he's uh, a terrible narcissist and says that he's responsible for everything good in the world. But nevertheless, there is a thread that runs from 2016 to, to this week, uh, which says he... Uh, does believe that it's a it's a losing war, it's a wasteful war, that the US has no business being there. Um, but as I said before, the problem for that is that the US has a lot of baggage in the Middle East. It's got a series of new Middle East wars. It has a supposed influence in Iraq, which is trying to contain the influence of Iran because Iran is the major sponsor of the resistance in Palestine and uh, including Hezbollah, including Syria. So the whole region is um, at stake. And that's probably why the intensity of the internal struggle within, within what they call a deep state, or you might say, as Trump recently repeated, the military industrial complex, the people that want to keep these wars going. And the last thing I'll ask before I hand it back to Joe is just to ask, do you think that the um, removal of, uh, of uh, John Bolton from uh, you know, his, his role in the Trump administration had anything to do with this or, or not? I myself don't think that's too important because Trump is a person who he has his own style and that is hiring and firing people and getting different perspectives and so on. And, uh, and also talking things up and then talking things down and trying to cut a deal and so on. So I think that, you know, Bolton to me was another person who was there who prevented attacks on Trump from a certain section of U S politics by the fact that him being there, um, I don't think in itself it's uh, it's that important, but certainly there is this um, you know internal chess game going on, which is important in terms of what the outcome is going to be. Maybe Trump has consolidated his influence within the administration to the point where he can do this, and facing a lot of a lot of opposition, a lot of tension with Turkey over the last couple of years. But um, I think the the internal struggle is important. I don't think Bolton was that important. Uh, Tim, a couple of things before I ask you about uh, your trips to Damascus. Is the UN side of this diplomacy dead? I mean, they had a Geneva process, and now you, you mentioned the Astana uh, process uh, several times, but you haven't mentioned the UN. Has that just completely been sidelined? To some extent, but there's still a representative, a Secretary General representative involved, and effectively the UN process has ended up backing the Astana process. So it's sort of been collapsed to some extent into the Astana process. And uh, what it means is that Russia diplomatically took the lead there basically, and it's joined in the big neighbors, you know, the Turkey and Iran there. Um, so uh, basically the US lost the diplomatic game in, in that respect, but it doesn't mean the UN's entirely out of the picture because the UN is involved in this, uh, you know, the construction of a, a a, a constituent assembly, if you like, or a committee to formulate a new Syrian constitution. That that side right. of the political process, the U.S. is linked into. How does the officials and how do the officials in Damascus feel about a new constitution and the UN writing it? I remember in Egypt after the fall of Mubarak, there was uh, some talk at the UN about uh, helping the Egyptians, and they were incensed by this that foreigners would have to get involved. But they had a long tradition, legal tradition there. They had good enough lawyers. And smart enough people to write their own constitution. Yes, well, the short answer is that the UN is not writing it, basically, um, and nor is the UN selecting the people for it. Um, there has been a type of a struggle over that. There, um, the US, of course, has wanted that the big powers have a say in who who is selected onto this commission. Um, even Russia, to a certain extent, has had a tension with Syria over that, but the Syrians have. Uh, well, they remember they're at the core of the resistance of defending their country here, and they have maintained a very strong hand in um, what's going to happen with the selection process. For example, 
the, a debate has gone on for some years about whether the UN is actually uh, creating this commission or whether the UN is facilitating the Syrians to do it. And so the language of Syrian driven and so on has got into all of those resolutions. And um, the, the Syrians have enough political will to say more than say the Iraqis did when the similar sort of process happened in Iraq, that the, uh, they're not, they're, they're very alive to the fact that the, you know, who is on that commission, how the new constitution is going to be framed is not going to escape their hands, basically, uh, even if Russia puts a bit of pressure on them. Russia so far has, uh, in a number of respects, made some suggestions and then pulled back when the Syrians have said, no, we don't want to do this, for example. So there is a, there is a bit of a, 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 you know, a tussle going on at that level. But Assad and his closest advisors have accepted that they need a new constitution. Which I think is also surprising. Why well, wouldn't? Uh, what are yes, they, they? Is they doing it for international goodwill? Do they feel they have to show, make some kind of reforms after all of both, this? Or, or, both. Or, or do they really want to? Are there real changes needed to make it both. more democratic? Okay. It, it's both in a way. Um, for example, there are residual, uh, let's say, Islamist elements in the in the Syrian constitution, which were put there as a sop to the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, the Syrian the Syrian president must be a Muslim, for example. Um, Hafez al-Assad didn't want that actually. But, uh, and in fact, there are some other, there are some, let's say, more, more secular forces in Syria that want to get rid of it. So there are some, there are some gen and, and there was a constitutional reform in 2012, remember, which removed the Ba'ath monopoly from, uh, from the Syrian system. Um, one of the major demands of political reform process of 2011, by the way. So there are some other areas that the, the Ba'ath Party, which is still in power, uh, uh, and others want change. So, uh, you know, the Syrians will use, but on the other hand, there's also the diplomatic side of it, that in a sense that there's um, being seen to give a wider voice in the construction or the, or the reconstruction or the reform of the constitution is seen as helpful for stabilizing the country, basically. Now, there was a, a reform movement, I think in 2008, around that time. Uh, and it didn't really go as far as it probably could have. Was that a mistake? Could Assad had done more there to try to stave off the initial uprisings, which led to the internationalization of the war? Yeah, I mean, well, that's arguable. There was indeed a, a very powerful consensus in 2005, right. uh, something called the Damascus Declaration that was created, right. a, a document which was very powerfully critical of the Ba'ath Party, of cronyism, corruption, and so on, um, signed by pretty much all the parties except the Muslim Brotherhood, which was, um, which was banned still at that time. Um, some of the Kurdish militia had an ambiguous position on it. But one of the things that that De Damascus Declaration said for all that it was very scathingly critical of the Syrian government at that time was that they rejected the idea of a attacks on the state or, or attacks on the army and then rejected the idea of foreign intervention. So that was built very strongly into the, um, into the Damascus Declaration. Along comes 2011, you've got a genuine political foment which was paralleled by a Salafist insurrection, basically, which took cover under that and drove the demonstrators off the street, basically. Uh, we should remember that in 2011, 2012, uh, Assad actually uh, gave in to a lot of those demands, effectively. Um, you know, he disciplined the governor of Dara for how he dealt with the, the protests. There was a constitutional referendum in early 2012, which uh, the, main, the main change of which was to remove the Ba'ath Party monopoly. So there has been a, there were, and, and the state of emergency was withdrawn uh, during a state of war. So there have been a number of changes there and uh, the, the government itself is, uh, oh, there were some other, some other uh, ministers in the government came in from some other parties, some non-party people and some party people. There was a type of a coalition government formed in 2012 with the Ministry of Reconciliation and so on, which is now gone because uh, for other reasons. So there has been a process of political accommodation at that time. I think it's, of course, in the West, the problem is that there was this uh, illusion that Assad was somehow impermeable to, to any sort of reform proposals. And it, what happened was basically the, the Salafist insurrection um, backed by international uh, jihadists um, drove all the political reform process off the streets. And people who were in the political reform process in those first few years, 
weeks and months of 2011 have said to me from, from early days that they resent the fact that the international media keeps talking about the Al-Qaeda, Muslim Brotherhood, um, jihadist uh, armed groups as representing the opposition. You know, these are people who were in the Damascus Declaration, who were in the, the political reform process for decades before. Well, that's interesting, because I was going to ask you, had there not been the Salafist uprising backed by foreign powers, mostly from the Gulf originally, could that reform process have succeeded and prevented uh, a war? Well, I mean, there are many people who say, look, Assad uh, agreed to most of the reform demands back at that time, but it did nothing to change the Salafist uh, insurrection. Right. Um, so, so, so if know. they weren't there, it may have worked. We'll never know, obviously. We can't, we'll can't. never know whether that would have been the case. Oh. But I'm really interested in that early period because there are people to this day, particularly here in the U.S., who think they know what they're talking about in Syria, who still see this as some popular in the street uprising against the government. He's just slaughtering his own people. Now, many of the people that the Arab, Syria, Arab army has killed are foreigners. So he's not killing his own people so much, uh, or as many, or only, but many foreign fighters from yeah. across the Muslim world have gone there to fight. That's true. That early I, part of the war there is so important because from the very beginning, you're saying, just days really from that Dara uprising, right? With the, the students who wrote on the wall. It didn't take long. Were these Syrians at first? Were these Muslim Brotherhood activists at, at, yes, the, at the beginning? And then how soon after that did uh, Gulf money start coming in backing foreign fighters? No, the Gulf money came in from the beginning. I mean, they intercepted a shipment of arms from the Saudis through um, Al Tant, through from Iraq. Um, you know, on, I think it was March the 11th, March wow. the 11th, before, before the insurrection took place. And the arms that were accumulated at the Al Amari Mosque in Dara came from the Saudis at that time. So the Salafists were, because this was, this was coming for some time, basically, it was being prepared. The tunnels in Italy, um, the, the route from Italy into Aleppo, for example, was anticipated to the, some of the tunnels were being prepared for years in advance, really. So um, the fact that there was a, a reformist movement in early 2011, as I say, it was, it was really, there were two things going on at once, basically. So uh, that, that period is interesting, as you say, because also the, the extent of the violence in the early weeks of the insurrection was played down by both sides. This is a point that uh, Shami Nawani made in some of her articles, that the government wanted to play down the, the killing of soldiers in March and April 2011, um, and the other side did too, because they were saying it was peaceful protesters for the first six months. That was the Human Rights Watch line, basically. But, I mean, the whole theme of Assad killing his own people was a very powerful uh, meme that was driven through the whole process, the reason for the intervention, basically. The best answer to it is to see the opinion polls all through the war. Basically, Assad increased his population amongst the Syrian people during that war. And it isn't just the Syrian polls you look at because Turkey um, and Qatar and NATO consultants did their own surveys of this too, and they all came to the same conclusion. Assad remained very popular. Um, so all of the stories about targeting schools, targeting hospitals, killing his own people, you have to put that against the fact that Assad is far more popular in his own country than most of the leaders who are against him. Erdogan in his country, all of the US presidents in their own country, for example. Well, if anyone, and you know, at the beginning, uh, I certainly thought that there was a, a lot more democracy that could be had in Syria. But once ISIS was established, particularly, that did it for me in terms of saying that the best outcome is for uh, Damascus to win this war. Because, he, I mean, Assad has never threatened Europe. He's not even threatened Israel. I mean, his father and himself uh, talked about the Golan Heights, but there really uh, hasn't been any action on that. There's a lot of rhetoric on that, but I don't know if, they, if Israel has ever felt threatened from Syria about that. So uh, Assad was certainly is still the better choice, even, though, even if you look at it as a lesser of two evils, than, than this collection of, of extremists. You've supported Assad from day one, haven't you? I supported the Syrian people's right to self-determination. That was the principle I came in on. And within a fairly short period of time, I realized that uh, the Syrian army and Assad certainly had very, very strong support there, very, very strong support on the ground. In fact, first time I went to Syria in 2013, um, I heard criticism of President Assad, but it wasn't the Western criticism. It's, they called him Mr. Softheart. They were worried that he wasn't as hard a man as his father. 
and they thought that he was, for example, he disarmed the police that went along to some of the rally, the early rallies in Idlib, for example. And as a result, the police were killed by the Salafists, you know. So that was one thing. And then uh, back to your question, Joe. And my question was whether you supported uh, the Assad government from the beginning or did you later? Oh, yeah. You said you supported the Syrian people, not necessarily the I government. I support the Syrian people, the, the right of the Syrian people to self-determination, which is the case in any foreign intervention, basically. It's, it's the essential principle. What I was going to say about Assad was that there was criticism, worry that he was too soft to handle this sort of crisis. And then uh, I remember hearing in 2013 with the, when the Geneva talks started, uh, it may have been 2012 when they started, but in 2013, there was this uh, suggestion from a Syrian vice minister that I heard that they legalized the Muslim Brotherhood. Maybe a step there was to legalize because the Muslim Brotherhood was the major internal domestic enemy effectively involved with the, with the, with the Salafist uh, insurrection. And uh, when I passed that idea back to some people who were very pro-government, they said, we will be against the Saad. We will be against the Saad if he legalizes the Muslim Brotherhood. Why are we fighting this war? if not against these people, basically. So it, it wasn't something that came to fruition in Geneva, but they, there was a very strong reaction from people to the idea that they would actually legalize the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, if Assad was going to do that, they would have opposed Assad in doing it. What's happened to the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria? Because once uh, the war really started getting going, at least in the Western coverage, you never heard this mentioned. Now, these guys were fighting in various other jihadist groups. They weren't fighting as... Uh, a movement as their own movement, were they? No, that's true. Um, but the, the first big group, um, the, the um, what were they called again? The brigade that was in Homs, basically, um, Farouk Brigade. The Farouk Brigade were effectively, you know, the next generation of Muslim Brotherhood after the Hama insurrection. Now, the Hama insurrection is, has its own mythology associated with it too, but it was, it was, there was a continuity there that there was a insurrection in Hama in 1982, which was very similar to the insurrection in Dara. That is to say, it began with rooftop snipers and so on to bring in the security forces, claim that civilians were victims and so on. There's a mythology around that. So the Muslim Brotherhood, the Fruit Brigade was effectively defeated in 2012. And then the big influx of foreign fighters be began to come in from Turkey, to some extent Lebanon, but from Turkey. And then they tried to recreate a domestic Syrian Muslim Brotherhood group in the, in the name of Ara al-Sham for quite some time. Um, and then Jaish al-Islam, for example. So these, these groups were, there was many of them and some of them were bigger and more influential. I mentioned the bigger ones basically, but that's, there's a long uh, history of that in Syria. And um, that is the domestic side of things, which you can't discount. It's true, there were probably hundreds of thousands of foreigners who went to Syria, including their families and all the rest of the baggage that came with them and so on. But there were large groups of, uh, let's say Salafists linked to the Muslim Brotherhood and mercenaries who were hired on top of that, a lot of less educated country boys, for example. Going back to that 2013, when the, the suggestion was that the Muslim Brotherhood perhaps be legalized, the thought was there that in peacetime, the Muslim Brotherhood could have had support of up to 15% of the population. But in a wartime, when it emerged, that there was a conflict, a real conflict, and the choice was between the government and the, the Salafist groups. That, that support would shrink back down to perhaps something like five or 6%, something like that. Indeed, that's what a Turkish poll showed in late 2011, that uh, Tesev, a Turkish group, did a poll on, uh, in, in late 2011, published in 2012, and they found that 5% of the population supported the violent attacks on the government at that time. Well, so that was from Turkey, a very... Hmm. I'm sorry, is there... As in Egypt, there is, they broke with some of the violent jihadists of the 80s, for example, and more or less renounced violence. Uh, did that ever happen in Syria? Was there a section, at least, of the Muslim Brotherhood leadership who have never supported joining any of these other groups and using violence? The Muslim Brotherhood was a political network, um, you know, underground political network, and there were periods when they were quiescent, let's say, uh, if you look at Salafism, the actual, as a, because it has a, a, a religious doctrine there, there have been non-violent Salafists. They were very sectarian, but they weren't violent. The Muslim Brotherhood essentially was about power. It was about a network of power. So they always wanted power in some form. They were banned most of the time in Egypt, most of the time in Syria. And so their history has been effectively. And, and then, of course, we have to remember that the fact that they got funding from the Gulf monarchies, and particularly the Saudis, 
created that alliance between Wahhabism and Muslim Brotherhood. There's still that tension between Wahhabism and Muslim Brotherhood that effectively drove them into this sectarian violence, basically uh, Saudi style violence. Uh, there are these differences which you see with the, you know, the, the attacks that Saudi Arabia made on Qatar, for example, which is really the base of which is, you know, the jealousy that the Saudis have to the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a much wider network, you know, in Turkey, in, in Egypt, in Qatar and so on. But nevertheless, the alliance for most of the time between the, the, the Saudi Arabian Wahhabis and the Muslim Brotherhood drove it into much more of a consistent pattern of violence. It's interesting because they're not particularly fond of the Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi Arabia, particularly in the UAE. But uh, uh, Elizabeth asked a really good question before about how about the misrepresentations in the Western media about Syria in general. You know, there's a couple that I want to point out and I want to know what you think. One, when Putin came to the UN, and I was there at the UN headquarters that day, and he made this extraordinary speech in which he offered to the United States to join with Russia as the Soviet Union and the US did against the Nazis to fight ISIS, to come together, that it was not gonna be, a, he didn't want a necessarily unilateral Russian intervention that mm -hmm. was invited by the Syrian government, that he wanted the US to take part. And yet mm -hmm. that was never really reported. Instead, we heard this isn't a chance for Russia to regain its imperial glory in the Middle East. This is the way it was framed. A bunch of imperialists here in the US could only project onto Russia imperialist motives not to actually fight an extremely dangerous group that was allowed to grow by the U.S., by the Gulf, as we know from a leaked DIA Defense Intelligence Agency document from August 2012 that this group was forming in eastern Syria, and the uh, Obama administration did a did sweet F.A. about that. They did nothing to, to stop that. And then we have the John Kerry leaked tape when he was talking to some Syrian exiles in New York on the sidelines of the General Assembly years in which he said that we saw ISIS advancing towards Damascus and we were watching and waiting, hoping they would put pressure on Assad to leave. So they were not fighting ISIS there. And here you have Trump claiming victory of ISIS when everybody who knows anything about this war knows that it's been the Russians, the Iranians, Hezbollah and uh, Iraqi militias that have defeated ISIS, not the U.S. and the Kurds fighting for the the U.S. These are just some of the ridiculous things, and on the debate stage here in the U.S. for the Democratic Party Tuesday night, we heard some of the most extraordinary and deluded things. Um, for example, uh, Tulsi, uh, Tulsi Gabbard said the truth, which was that the U.S. had a regime change war in Syria, and of course, they all. Joe Biden said it was a, it was untrue, and this guy, this was a bald faced lie. So, I mean, uh, I'm frustrated because I'm in the media and I was in the corporate mainstream media for many, many years and I'm happy to be out of it and doing, running consortium news, but this is a real issue. How do you break through to get real information to people about the complexity of the Syrian war and the US role in it? Well, of course, speaking of Joe Biden, he in 2014 made admissions that all his close allies right. were in fact supporting all of the jihadist groups, all of the, from Jabhat al-Nusra, HTS, whatever, to ISIL um, that the Saudis and Turkey and the others were supporting them. So he admitted that. Uh, let's remember also that going back to the roots of uh, ISIS, we have to go back further than Syria. We have to go back to Iraq because in 2006, when uh, Condoleezza Rice was announcing the new Middle East wars, so the beginning of the new Middle East, or the, 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 the coherence of the new Middle East wars, let's say, um, that was the time when Seymour Hirsch published that article, The Redirection, about the plan of Washington precisely to inflame a Sunni Shia division and try and weaken Baghdad in particular. Baghdad was the Messiah, uh, the Islamic State in Iraq, before it became the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. That was 2006, 2007, when major Shia mosques were being bombed in, in, in Iraq. So it was used to try and stop Baghdad getting close to Tehran back then, uh, what, 12, 13 years ago. And then it was re-weaponized, as you pointed out, in, in early 2012, in 2012, 2013, to move across into Syria for the same thing as the DIA report, I think you referred to, mentioned that it was about isolating and weakening Damascus and that uh, the, the US was very happy with the idea of <coughs> a caliphate, a Salafi caliphate. A South Principality is what it was called in that document, right. later, later a caliphate, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I want to ask you about, but first, one more question about Idlib, and Elizabeth, if you want to join in, because I want to talk about life in Damascus now under in this war. Uh, 
I remember when Aleppo finally was regained by the Syrians with the Russian help, they put a lot of these jihadists on buses with their families and sent them to Idlib. It's like, I thought at that moment they're concentrating them in Idlib and then there's going to have to be maybe the final showdown there. Mm -hmm. Was that the idea? And how can you have this showdown without avoiding massive civilian casualties like we saw in Mosul, like we saw in Raqqa, for example? Yes, well, I think that the, the reason is and the reason why, contrary to the, the Western mythology of making Assad as some monster, you know, the new Hitler, uh, was that they were really trying to avoid bloodshed rather than have a, a fight to the finish in a lot of areas, you know, the East Ghouta, for example, and Aleppo, and which would have uh, caused a huge amount of bloodshed. They gave a way out. And not everyone was happy with that. Not everyone was happy with, with uh, some of these uh, people who'd committed terrible crimes being effectively given a second chance. Um, but nevertheless, it was trying to avoid bloodshed. And of course, the problem of wide-scale bloodshed in having future reconciliation, that was spoken of in Syria from very early days. You know, They had to limit the bloodshed to try and limit the extent of bitterness and the ongoing problem they had to deal with um, in the future in terms of what they call the Musalaha reconciliation process. So yes, they were concentrating them in Idlib from a, a, no, a number of different areas from the south, from East Ghouta, from, from Aleppo, from Hama, for example. But, um, uh, you know, and it, it's, it's created a situation where they have to come to a final showdown. There's no more green buses. There is still the process, at least for Syrians, to uh, have a, uh, what do they call it? They ha having their legal affairs regularized in some sort of ways. They've done that in a lot of areas. For example, in the south, uh, down around Dara Kanetra, in East Ghouta, they have, um, in East Ghouta, for example, uh, about 80 months ago, I was there. And was it? No, it must have been last year sometime. Yeah, 80 months ago last year. That Failak al-Rahman, which is one of the Islamist groups working with Jabal al-Nusra in the East Ghouta, uh, 1,200 of them had agreed to a reconciliation process through their sheikhs and had joined the Syrian army. So on the checkpoints in the East Ghouta, government-controlled East Ghouta, you have these wild-eyed guys with, with wild hair and beards and so on who've been taking captagon amphetamines for years, um, actually on Syrian army checkpoints. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are not very happy with this. There are people who've fought on the side of the jihadists for years who are now roaming round, you know, apparently free and to some extent incorporated into the Syrian army. It's a very imperfect situation, you know, but it's something that the Syrians have done to try and resolve the conflict and limit the bloodshed in the first instance. What you have in Idlib now is the hardcore who refuse all of those sorts of offers and either they're going to escape into Turkey or into Europe or fight to the death. That's, that's what seems to be going on there. I went, uh, I went to Damascus once in March 2011, believe it or not, just a few uh, weeks before the uprising began and in the lobby of my hotel I was watching uh, Al Arabiya and they were showing sh scenes of fighting in the streets of Tripoli and, and uprisings and trouble in Libya and I was wondering why they would show this. I, I think the good that they did, I'm all for freedom uh, of information obviously, but why the Syrian government would allow the Syrian people to see this, would it give them some ideas that this, this Arab, so-called Arab Spring was spreading and could spring uh, spread to their country was Assad too confident in his uh, in control of power at that point? Well, there was a lot of openness in Syria at that time, and to some extent there still is, but probably I don't know that Al Arabiya is still in the country in that way. Certainly Al Jazeera got kicked out. Mm. But uh, I have to say that um, amongst my friends at that time in March, and for the few months, maybe uh, at least three months after that, Al Jazeera was watched in Damascus. In fact, a lot of you to the to the Syrian stations, for example, because it seemed to be more more open and more cosmopolitan and so on. But on the other hand, you had you had uh, Al Jazeera in particular. You know, the Qatar, Qatari station, uh, Al Arabiya was Saudi's way of trying to play catch up with Al Jazeera because Al Jazeera was was doing it better basically. But Al Jazeera was also showing these uh, supposed rallies put down by the police, and people would look at it and say, look out their window and go and say, just a minute, this isn't exactly right. So there was a, a very rapid crash in the credibility of Al Jazeera, for example, in 2011. And of course, uh, you know, the, now the, the, the feeling in terms of 
what the the role the Saudis have played is very strong in Syria. Of course, I don't I don't think the Saudis. Apparently, the Emirates are back in there to some degree, you know, and it, with some investments. But uh, and maybe they've reopened their embassy there. But the the bitterness at the role of the Saudis and uh, also Qatar is very strong still in Damascus. What is life like now in right now in Damascus? The last time you were there, how do you get there? Do you have to fly to where do you fly in from? Amman? Where is there a flight? You can fly in from the Gulf, from Dubai, on wow. Syrian air, but the easiest way is to get in is just to drive in from Beirut, basically. There's okay. um, right. You can get a taxi or a couple of taxis from Beirut. It's only about three hours from Beirut to Damascus. Damascus is very uh, tranquil now since, like, what's the beginning of last year, beginning of 2018, when they liberated East Ghouta and Douma. Um, I visited Douma a few months after that, and there was a, a sort of a normalization going with it with some of those problems that I mentioned. There are still some sleeper cells and so on. But there have been no, first of all, the jihadists never really controlled the old city or most of Damascus, unlike Aleppo. Um, uh, it's mainly the Iskuta, the, the eastern rural green belt that uh, they were in. And there were some old, old parts that they uh, ransacked and so on there. But uh, they were firing in mortars from Iskuta into the old city for quite a long time. You know, there are still shrapnel marks on the asphalt on the roads in the bus stop at Bub Tuma and so on in, in, in the Christian area of the East Old City. But it's very peaceful now. In the last 18 months it's been very peaceful and uh, the Old City wasn't seriously damaged. Um, a lot of people died as a result of attacks in the past but there are no terrorist attacks in Damascus anymore. It's starting to recover its, um, its, its normality. It has been gradually over a number of years I might add because the, the strange thing about a war you probably know is that somehow people after years get used to certain things in a strange sort of way they get used to this uh, even school children get used to the fact that there's going to be a you know a shell or a missile every now and then anyway that's all gone now but um, there's a sense of normality in, in damascus certainly to know new holes in the roof in the corrugated iron roof of the old souk and all you know those holes are up there from the, the french who i think in 1925 fired from their airplanes right through the tin roof, the, down on people inside the souk. Uh, it's an amazing thing to look up and see the sunlight coming through those holes. So there was that's no damage there. there. Yeah, that's, that's still there. But there were some bombings around there because there are some Shia shrines around there. There, there were some bombings. There's still tight security around the, the Shia shrines, but the, the checkpoints in general are more relaxed in Damascus. So when you come to the souks in Aleppo and Homs, that's different, of course. They've reconstructed the souk in Homs completely with a new roof with a lot of new materials, keeping some of the old style. But the one in Damascus you mentioned is, is still as is. So there's an economy there. I mean, people are in cafes and restaurants. There's life is normal there. You wouldn't know there was a war going on pretty much now. It is, except for the fact that you've got this economic war going on and you do have... Um, uh, you know, very low salaries and very high prices and a lot of shortages, you know. So the economic war, which is very, very intense, you know, you, you can't use any sort of credit card there. The banking system for foreigners doesn't work at all. You have to take cash in there. Uh, there's shortages, there's high prices for things. So that economic war is certainly hurting people. And of course, it's affecting the health system. It's affecting a lot of things. Fuel, you know, the shortages of fuel, there's still rationing of fuel. There's that, that economic war is still going on. And despite that, he's still popular outside, you say? Yes, yes. He's seen as a, he and, and Putin and Nasrallah and the Iranians, they're seen as, they're seen as great, great heroes, basically great resistance heroes, because everyone knows very well that Syria is a very small country and it's had very big powers ranged, ranged against it. No, when, um, when I was there, I, every, every, was, they were strategically placed, photos of Bashar and photos of Hafez's father, everywhere you go. And uh, I wonder, is there any chance for some kind of multi-party democracy in Syria, or is that a pipe dream? Well, there, uh, it, the, the multi-parties have been there for some, some time, but, you know, the history of assassinations and so on. Um, in the parliament, there are multi-parties. In the, in the uh, there was the first, in 2014, five years ago, there was the first uh, multi-candidate presidential election as opposed to a plebiscite. So they're moving in that sort of direction. One interesting thing was that if you looked at the National Assembly elections in 2012 and 2016, the Ba'ath Party, since its monopoly on power was effectively written out of the Constitution, increased its vote. 
despite the dissatisfaction with cronyism and corruption and so on in the Ba'ath Party, nevertheless, they went from something like 52% of the vote to 60% of the vote in the, in the National Assembly in 2016. So, uh, you know, there is, that, there is that process which is going to be uh, enhanced, I guess, by this constitutional committee. Now, uh, how many times have you met Bashar al-Assad? Now, you, you mentioned Tulsi Gabbard earlier. She has called him a brutal dictator. But as you also mentioned, they were, these guys were put on buses, not lined up against the wall, and shot to take care of this problem right away, which a brutal dictator probably would do without any problem, like Saddam Hussein. He's not Saddam, Saddam Hussein. No, and he never was. He never was. It's, it's an extraordinary achievement, really, of the, uh, of the humanitarian war team, particularly in the US, I guess, but to some extent in Europe, that they painted this guy who was, you know, before the war and still is really, in my view, a mild-mannered eye doctor who was very concerned about the psychological damage on children and the impact on their culture and so on. Um, that's why they called him Mr. Softheart. That's why there was some hesitance in supporting him in the early days because they thought that he wouldn't be wouldn't have a firm hand, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right that the, the characterization was quite false and also, but also, really a remarkable achievement in terms of modern propaganda. How can you? How could, I think the British ambassador, for example, recently said, we are in Syria because Assad is killing his own people. But Adolf Hitler didn't kill his own people either, really. Not people he considered as patriotic Germans. <laughs> he yeah. killed people who he considered as non-Germans. You know, as well, non except the ones he sent to the Russian front, but uh, <laughs> that's another thing. But, um, he had a lot of them killed. But I mean, let's not paint too rosy a picture. I know government is perfect, and certainly uh, this is not a system that is in a European tradition of having multi-parties and the kind of political campaigns that we used to. Maybe that's not something that the Syrians want. I don't know. I'm not speaking for them. But uh, there is a police state there. There is the Mahabharat, which is very strong and was way before the war began. There was definitely a, a, a displeasure with the government by yes. lots of people. Yes. And he, uh, he admitted that to us when we first met him in 2013. He knew that uh, a very large proportion of people didn't like the government. Of course, his popularity, because he was also credited, remember, with opening up the economy and removing some of the restrictions on the economy and introducing the internet and so on. Um, his popularity has always sat uh, higher than the Ba'ath Party. I would say the army's popularity sits higher than even him too, but he's a commander in chief of the army. So uh, you're right that the Muqabarat, the, uh, the secret police were feared. Uh, by a lot of people. Uh, I've got friends who were arrested and, you know, detained by them and so on. I've seen them in action myself, basically. But of course, in a situation of war, people complaining about the secret police yeah. lose their credibility, don't they? Basically, the war on Syria has meant that the Muqabarat, the secret police, is basically strengthened its hand for the next generation, basically, um, because people are very worried about the, the fact that, for example, in certain parts of the country, Syrians would, in the Yamuk camp, in Hama, for example, that people would invite in Jabhat al-Nusra, you know, as, as, as good Muslims or whatever, and then their children would be killed as a result of people, you know, traitors in their own midst, the people are worried about that, you know, so if that doesn't uh, re-legitimize a secret police, I don't know what does. Well, I could go on and on about many things, about the fault, the chemical weapons attacks and white helmets and et cetera. There's so much more to talk about. I just want to bring Elizabeth in for a couple questions before we sign off. Sure. No, I would open up the floor to that type of questioning as well. I think that's very interesting. I'd like to get uh, Tim's thoughts on some of those things, but, but I'll, you know, try to limit it just to one question which is more, um, you know, more relevant to recent events, and that is to return again to Tulsi Gabbard. And I just want to read a, a very small tweet thread that she published within the last uh, 24 to 48 hours. She said, quote, Trump to Kurds, I got you a great deal. I gave Turkey your homeland and homes, and you have five whole days to pack up your families." and leave slaughter you be out of the deal how to sell what's not yours and i wanted to get your response to that tim and what are your thoughts on that that take by tulsi well you know the thing is um you know tulsi is one of the best you've got in terms of this particular territory but there is a language in u.s debate which is entirely to do with the u.s debate you know and uh you know calling people a brutal dictator and one thing and another right. it's something that sort of to me, they're qualifiers. They qualify someone to enter the debate. If you don't use these cliches, you don't get into the debate there, basically. And I think that 
Tulsi was backed into a few corners to use those sorts of expressions, you know. I think that she genuinely saw some of the reality on the ground. I know there's that famous video of her with Christians in Aleppo and the Christians giving her a perspective on what they think about the government what and the conflict and so on. So I think that she knows a bit better than that, basically. But, you know, in terms of the cliches that are used, and I, I, some people, I think, mistakenly on my side, on the anti-war side and the people that support the resistance, uh, wrongly criticise, say, for example, US journalists for using some of this language. I think it's just part of the territory, basically, you know, that, you know, so long as the US um, respects international norms, we don't really care what they say about about the Syrians and their process, basically. You know, they but can... they don't respect international norms. And this yeah, language that's right. being used leads to a deluded and totally misguided public about the important issues like Syria, where American troops are, for example, where American money is going, where sanctions are being imposed. So this that's... is really important, the language, the political language in the U.S., I think. It just props up some premises about America's good intentions, etc., covering up the real role of America's plays. So does, I, I wouldn't dismiss it so easily as that, but that's my opinion. No, but I mean, I think what I'm getting at, it, there are some people who are very purist who say, well, you know, you haven't got it right because you're calling it a regime and because you're saying they're sensitive about going into certain areas and so on. I think people can be too exacting about those sorts of things. I think if people are on the right track, if they're saying that the US should withdraw there, the US should respect that it... Actually, the language of the, the UN Security Council, language of the Astana agreements is quite good. It's just that they aren't respecting that, that, that particular language, basically. So anyway, all I'm saying is that I don't use the language of US journalists because I'm not talking to that audience, generally speaking, basically. And I think, right. that, I think that to be heard, there are some cliches about uh, countries that have been, you know, there's been, what, nine years of propaganda here. We can't underestimate the impact that has on people. And to get into the debate in the US, people, including Tulsi, have to use some of this sort of language. Yeah, well, when, you, well, when you're talking about um, Democratic primary presidential, you know, candidates that are trying to vie for this nomination, I think uh, that does go to into this is to borrow some of Joe's language. It goes to the unacknowledged third rails, and there are multiple of them, and we could get into that. That would be a whole other discussion, but I think that that goes to what you're saying in a way. Well, Tim, I wanted to thank you for being with us. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your background in some quarters, particularly in the mainstream. Well, anyway, a lot of people we have on this show are controversial. Uh, conservative yeah. news might be seen that way, but you have also a background where you were twice convicted for political violent crimes, but then uh, one on appeal was overturned and then was pardoned another time after an yeah. inquiry. Could you just give a quick rundown of your, in your youth, were you committed to political violence? No, I wasn't committed to political violence, but I was involved in political activities and myself and two others were framed for a, a political, political violence back in the 70s. We spent seven years in jail. I wrote a couple of books about it at the time. The last one's called Take Two, The Criminal Justice System Revisited. We were pardoned after an inquiry and paid compensation for wrongful imprisonment. And then they tried it a second time and I was acquitted. So there's a history there where I was deeply involved in uh, prisoners' rights and civil rights activities. I became a civil rights ag ac activist in the 80s and 90s, basically. And then later on, I returned to my original interest, which was in international matters. But there is a history there, which I posted online. My book called Take Two deals with that. But you still probably face a lot of opposition, even in Australia, as we do here, if we explain the war in the terms that we've been discussing, I tell you, don't you? Well, that's right. And it goes to the language question too, doesn't it? That if you are uncompromising in your language, then uh, they will try and write you off and ignore you or attack you. I've been attacked many times by the corporate media here. And, uh, you know, with, with abuse and with dishonest abuse, for example, um, because I don't really want to compromise the way that I talk about these sorts of things. I think it's important that someone is actually talking about the history. On the one hand, talking about the, 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 the propaganda, the, the misinformation, also telling out to them what's going on there. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I notice that journalists do have to qualify themselves to enter in certain debates. And if you are uncompromising about your language, they will ignore you. But I really have decided I don't really watch television. I don't read systematically the corporate media so much. I get my sources from a lot, a much wider range there. I think it's important that there is some sort of stories being told that are rather un uncompromising in the way that they treat um, these conflicts, these wars, this series of wars in the Middle East in particular.
Well, Tim Anderson, thank you very much for joining us on CN Live. It's been a really enlightening and interesting discussion about Syria. Maybe we'll have you back sometime as this war continues.